On today's pod, uh, I take another deep dive into conference realignment, getting you ready for college football and other sports, including equestrian. Uh, we're going to have Field Yates on. He's going to give us all of his picks, top five rankings at all the positions for fantasy football. I have to get ready for a draft. He's going to give his sleepers, some theories, and one quarterback argument I cannot believe that he is making. And we have an extended life advice. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about. we have been traveling a bit, and there's a few monologue ideas kicking around, but I was doing my college football preview stuff, reading it, getting ready. You know, it's already been my favorite sport to watch. I just love Saturdays, and you've also heard me enough, um, if you're not new here, complaining about how much college football has changed, because we're changing a lot. We're changing a lot in sports, and we're making a lot of changes to a lot of sports in a very short amount of time, and with college football, there's no better example of, like, what are we doing? And it's not because I'm old, and it's not because I'm uh, just a preacher of tradition. It's just, I think sometimes we can get a little too far away from the things that matter. So let's get you caught up on all the different stuff that's been happening. Because I know I need a bit of a primer because every now and then I'll be like, oh, that's, they're there now. That's what's happening. Who's on the schedule? How does that work? They're still around. All right, so let's, let's recap some of this stuff. The Big Ten has 18 teams now. You knew this. That's the most teams in a single conference since the Southern Conference had 23 teams in the early 1930s. Um, I don't know what media days were like then. You can imagine 1932, gangs there for some ham sandwiches and pickles. And they're like, this is the future of college football right here, the Southern. We've got 23 teams. Top that. Um, The Pac-12 is the Pac-2. It's really a member guest of the Mountain West. Larry Scott should take a lot of the blame for this conference basically not existing. Uh, When he came in, guns blazing, marketing, tennis, he gets it. They want Texas, Oklahoma. Then they didn't want them. They ended up with Utah and Colorado. um, And now they're dead. The number of updates that we got on this TV deal that never materialized. And look, I don't know if Texas, Oklahoma were real and it could have saved them. I don't know if they should have realized they weren't going to make as much as the Big Ten or the SEC. Or if there was any deal. Like this even happened at Big East football. If they had just taken the deal. They probably could have kept that going. I don't know if that means long term, but there was probably a a point in time for the Pac-12. It's like this might be the best you can do, but it also means a much better chance at survival. You know what I did today? I went on to ESPN.com. I clicked on the college football standings. Everybody's zero zero right now, but it's all there. And it's look, it's not a cheat sheet. It's just a reality of oh, they're there now. If you go to the Pac-12, there's two teams: Oregon State, Washington State. Makes me sad. You're going to click on those standings? Let me check the standings in the Pac-12. Like, hey, we're a game out of first. Yep, you're also in last. And the Mountain West, I don't know if they're just going to be absorbed into the Pac-12. The Pac-12 is going to pretend this is still a Power 5 conference, or whatever that means. I mean, back in the day, like, hey, do we still get our automatic bid? Well, that's like, uh, I don't know. Just let us know. Let us know when you guys get that thing settled. It's sad, and it makes me sad. OK, there's an actual realignment tracker on ESPN.com. I didn't even know that it existed, but it's needed. When I was looking up different stuff this morning, I went through it. It was like, OK, so this happened then. These are the new teams. These are the teams they've lost. It's like nobody signed Tyus Jones yet. Um, when I looked at the Conference USA chart on Wikipedia, it was like trying to read the pre-market on Monday of Japan. Like there's a bunch of colors and there's some letters but I can't understand, like I'm looking at it, but what does any of this mean? Uh, Again, Conference USA was gutted by the American Conference because the American Conference lost a bunch of big profile programs to the Big 12. Conference USA had, what, five teams a couple years ago? Now they have Sam Houston State and Kennesaw State. So awesome. All right, so back to the Power 5 slash Power 4. The ACC has 17 teams because They're still worried about what's going to happen to them with Florida State and Clemson. So I guess they were like, "I Stanford and Cal are tough to get into. We'll add them too and SMU, right? Because that makes a ton of sense. Um, I don't know where you're going to be November 8th when Cal takes on Wake Forest, but I hope you're excited. I'm a little worried about NC State's back-to-back against Cal and Stanford as well. 
Uh, I'll tell you who's excited about Stanford, and that is the ACC Twitter account. When Katie Ledecky won gold again, um, the ACC Twitter account posted a picture of her celebrating her accomplishment with the hashtag Olympians made here, even if they weren't made there because Ledecky left Stanford in 2018. But this is not new. No one seems to care about the facts. I mean, Bama added five national championships because an SID had an afternoon. There was a Big Ten preview that I read that was a very favorable Big Ten preview, completely dismissing that half of the league sucked forever. Um, they said, look, the five, five of the best 10 teams in college football this year are Big Ten teams because of the final rankings of 2023. Yeah, kind of. But if all five of those teams had been in the same conference, do you think they all would have ended up going as far as they did and ending up in the top 10? Not really. But again, that's not that bad. It's not as egregious as Olympians made here. The Big 12, I remember reading Big 12 media notes, traveling to game day years ago, and I was trying to figure out this note. I don't know if it was Oklahoma State. Let's use them as an example. I'm not being critical of it, but I'll use it as an example. And when you're reading all these different team notes that sometimes can be put out by the teams, it said Oklahoma State has this many wins against active SEC schools. And I thought, that's a lot of wins. How would they even have played that many SEC schools in the last 10 years? That doesn't even make any sense. And Brad Edwards cracked the code. He goes, dude, they're counting wins against Missouri and AM when they were in the Big 12 as now SEC wins. Well, that doesn't seem very honest. Again, I still think 17 is too old to be running some of these accounts. The Big 12 is really the winner considering the challenges they were facing out of all of this because the challenges for the Big 10 and SEC are not there the way they are for everybody else. And it's trickled down to poaching everybody else going like, look, you guys can worry about it. But the Big 12, which was an endangered species, which would have been, it would have been a better bet to think the Pac-12 were going to survive 10 years ago than the Big 12 would have. And even though the Big 12 like hung on and hung on and then they lose Texas and Oklahoma, people make the 10 team joke. And now they're at 16 teams. They've added other teams in the past. This year, they have both Arizona schools. Colorado's back. They've got Utah in there. They've got great basketball. They found a way to just kind of hang on to the whole thing. All right. And you may have forgotten this on the basketball note that Cincinnati played in the Big 12 tournament's quarterfinal. Interesting tidbit there. Um, So good for them. They also have 12 slots with affiliate members for wrestling and equestrian, which is Cal Baptist, the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Denver for women's gymnastics. You want to go and really waste some time? Start looking at some of the Olympic sports and where they're affiliated. So I don't. I just would be upset if there were two roommates who was like, well, what are you talking about? I'm in the Atlantic 10. You're like, well, no, I'm in the Big 10 because of sport. I mean, right now, John Hopkins is in the Big 10 for lacrosse, so maybe none of this really matters, but it's starting to feel like it matters. Because nobody can keep track of any of this stuff anymore. And we know it's all driven by money. Like I was reading a note about Notre Dame with their new deal. I think they're going to pull in about $60 million for themselves. And people get pissed about it because they get pissed at Notre Dame. And by the way, there's many other high-profile programs that would love to be as disappointing at the end of the season as Notre Dame has been over the last however many years you want to go through. It's actually a little bit better than I think people want to give them credit for. But people just hate Notre Dame. They're mad Notre Dame gets $60 million, but they're not mad that Vandy and Bama get the same cut. And that's kind of back to that ACC argument of Florida State and Clemson. And that's at some point in life, you probably have to learn how to be a good partner. And right now in this sport, no one wants to be a good partner. The Big Ten commissioner was speaking the other day, and I'm going to be fair here because he was talking about expanding the playoffs. And when I first saw the quote, I went, can we actually do this version of the expanded playoffs before we start talking about expanding it already? Can we just do it this year? And what he really was saying, he was being very open-minded of the reality of, well, you know, we'll see how 12 goes, but I haven't ruled out any of these things. And that's the whole point is that it's going to keep going in that direction. And I think asking at times in this case, hey, what's the end game? (laughs) Like, what do you want this to be? Because something that matters, Conference affiliation, mapping the the cultures of different parts of the country and feeling like when you watched a product, it was a specific product that looked a little bit different than the product that was still the same product, but it was played in a different way because it was a different part of the country with different high schools and different coaches and different priorities. All of those things that I I could just see on Saturdays, none of it's going to matter anymore. And maybe it doesn't matter to you, 
Because I've heard the argument, this is the way that it's always been, right? Louisville's on their sixth conference. BYU's been in four conferences in 29 years. But here's a number, all right? Since Texas and Oklahoma announced three years ago they're going to go to the SEC, 33 FBS schools have changed conferences. That's fucking stupid. And that's the end of my argument. Hey, we're going to talk some fantasy with Field Gates of ESPN's Fantasy Focus podcast, uh, which is terrific. And the motivation behind this is on Thursday, Yahoo is going to do a league with Simmons and I and other Ringer employees. We're going to do a live draft on Thursday. So I need to prep. I need to get back in this deal. And Field is great. So excited to talk to him. So let's get to it. So I was looking at all the draft averages. I was looking at your rankings. I've actually done a lot of prep on this. I've been listening to multiple fantasy pods, just trying to get a gauge of where everything's at right now. Yeah. Um, And we're getting ready for our Thursday deal. So McCaffrey is the clear no-brainer. If you have the number one pick, there's, there's no argument to go with anyone else considering what he had 100 more points in scoring last year than any other running back yeah you know i tell people this frank uh, frequently is like fantasy football does have some elements that kind of like mirror economics in the market right and so like think of this as supply and demand they're just not going to be nearly as many game-changing running backs in fantasy football as there will be wide receivers which inherently makes the value of a top tier running back that much greater and he was so much better than the field last year like even Brees hall having this incredible receiving season and having nearly 1600 total yards and McCaffrey was still that much better Uh, we did this project this year which when I say it like it makes me sound like I have less of a life than I already acknowledge that I do we did 35 mock drafts it's kind of like an ESPN fantasy staff this summer Uh, plus some of the ones that I had been doing just like other leagues or just even like a little bit of prep myself Uh, and McCaffrey went uh, first in all but one of them so and I'm talking about like 40 to 50 total mock drafts he has gone first in every single one of them. And the only time he didn't was when somebody was like, I just want to mix, mix things up a little bit, so I'm taking CD Lamb. Okay, so that was the only other scenario where somebody went with a non-McCaffrey pick. Yeah, and, and, and CD Lamb, like, right. I, I have, like, you know, I've talked, I, I could talk, like, if I was, you know, if we were in court, I could make the case for CD Lamb, uh, Brees Hall, maybe, Bijan Robinson, maybe, Tyreek Hill, but it's almost like, you're, you're paying a premium on players you could likely get. Like, if you're inclined to take CD Lamb first overall, you might just offer the number one pick to the guy at number two and see if that person prefers Christian McCaffrey and then trade your first and second round pick for their first and second round pick and get CD Lamb and whatever one player ahead in the back end of the second round would be. Okay. So when I think about the running back position, because we'll stay here. You know, back in the day, there were just so many different ones that you could go with. I mean, that was kind of the strength of your team is if you have yeah. a great number one and a really good number two, you had a great chance of winning your league. But because of how the game has changed, and when you start looking at the total scoring from this position, it's like you wonder how deep you can go. So who do, who do you have as your top five running backs right now? And then let's just try to get to that cutoff point of now you're in trouble. Yeah, I just said there's a line. So the first five in this order, Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson, who are all in like the top six overall. So like regardless of position, those are three of my top six players. Next up, and I flip flop on these two guys, which is I'm saying that not to like take myself off the hook if one of them outperforms the other, but more to suggest just how close they are. Um, is Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor, like two guys who have been the top of the fantasy heap at the top of the fantasy heap in the past. Those guys are four or five. Then you get into Kyron Williams, Jameer Gibbs, Isaiah Pacheco, Derrick Henry as kind of like the first nine where I feel really good about those guys, either because what they've already done, what they are set up to do this year. Like even in the case of Derrick Henry, we talk about age all the time for running backs. It feels like the stars have aligned to be in Baltimore. Uh, and play in an offense that, not to get nerdy, but this is a fantasy football podcast, or at least a conversation about fantasy football with your podcast is like, yeah, just today. Um, (laughs) Like, what, like, for for Derrick Henry, he's used to, like, we love, like, a stacked box talk, right, on on, on any podcast we can find. Like, he's used to seeing eight men in the box all the time, right, in Tennessee when they had such a low volume and, frankly, like, not that scary passing attack surrounding him, especially after A.J. Brown got traded, where in Baltimore... Well, Lamar has never had like this super dynamic number one wide receiver for fantasy purposes during his time as the starter. He's led the NFL in passing touchdowns during his time in Baltimore. He's a two-time MVP. Like if you're just going to key on Derrick Henry, 
Lamar is going to win the MVP again this season. So he's in a really good spot. So those first nine I feel good about. Then you get into a territory of Alvin Kamara, Travis Etienne, a few others. I think the number is close to like 17 or 18 running backs. And then all of a sudden you can easily talk yourself out of those players. And there's like a general sense of where that takes place. It would be Aaron Jones, now in Minnesota, after being cut, Ramondre Stevenson, James Conner, um, Zach Moss, who if you're optimistic that like Cincinnati will make him the starter, you're kind of like, I, I, I like the player. I don't love the player or the situation. So if you play in a smaller league, it's more likely that a lot of the teams have two good running backs. You're prioritizing those backs early. If you're playing in a 16-team league, just by volume, the sheer number of teams that are going to be guaranteed two good starting running backs is lower. So you can be a little more unique at the top of the boards. But those running backs start to get scary in a hurry. Look, well, I used to play all the time, and I had a league with my buddies back home. And my problem would be I watched on Saturday, hey, this guy is good. Yeah. And that's just not what the game is. You can think about the scoring opportunities. So there are times when I'm like getting ready and thinking about it because it's only been like the last couple of years um, that I that I haven't had any kind of team or haven't been in the league at all. But like I'll look at Bijan, right? Like everybody right. loves Bijan, and I promise that this podcast w- episode will not be why did you do this? Why did you do this for forty minutes? But you have Bijan, I believe, third in your yeah. running back rankings. He was ninth in scoring last season, but it's this constant, and we'll do it when we get to Drake London and the receivers too. It's this, I, everybody's on the same page with this, this hope. This, it, it's the most optimistic anyone has ever been about a group of skill guys in that post-coaching change in Cousins being in Atlanta that Bijan and Pitts and London are all going to go off now. And look, Bijan is one of the most talented running backs we've seen come out, but to have him third, how much of that is just him I mean, it just seems to be complete faith that it can't be as bad as we just saw. Yeah, I think the baseline that he is working from last year at the quarterback spot is like not like bad. It's like maybe, you know, as bad as there was in the NFL last season, other than perhaps the Jets, maybe the Patriots. Like, I mean, I guess there were a handful of teams that had really, really bad quarterback play last year. But Atlanta, like we, we have a very well-established threshold of like what Kirk Cousins offenses will look like. The ceiling is probably not, top three or top five but the floor is probably like a league average offense so they're going to have way more trips to the red zone this year and because of reasons that i I would argue like are are illegitimate Bijan had two carries last year inside the five yard line two And, and i know that tyler algier is a good serviceable player but at some point like even if it wasn't you that made the call it wasn't you that was coaching when he was the eighth overall pick. Like you have to just recognize that it's going to have to be Bijan more than any other player on the offense. And I hear you on the idea of like everybody is like all of a sudden bouncing back on Bijan and Drickland and Kyle Pitts. But I that have, number field that that number is so absurd. That's an impossibility that that number will mirror what just happened. So there's like you're a right. Fullback who probably has like, there's probably a defensive player who had more goal to go carries last year than Bijan, right? Um, but I am not so I, I have like tepid expectations for Kyle Pitts again this year. So I've kind of felt like, because I do think at some point you can't just say like, it was really bad, they add Kirk Cousins and they change coaches and everything becomes like elite across the board. I think there's room for two stars in this offense and I'm banking on it being Bijan and Drake. That's where I have settled personally. Okay. okay, why isn't Jameer Gibbs going top five on average? Probably just because he's got more competent like if you're talking about sheer number of snaps he's going to play this year and more snaps equals more opportunities, he has probably the best co-starter or a backup running back in the NFL, right? David Montgomery is a starter on quite a few teams. And while Gibbs really picked up down the stretch in terms of his like red zone and goal line utilization, if they get the ball, like if they throw a bomb to JMO, Jamison Williams, and he catches it at the, at the eight yard line and is dragged down at the one, and they don't have to like hurry up to the ball to snap it. I think David Montgomery is coming on the field. That's my guess. And if that happens, like if there are opportunities where they have goal to go situations three, four, five, six times throughout the year and they have their choice of who gets the football, it's going to be David Montgomery. Whereas if you go to other backs that are drafted just ahead of him or right behind him, like even Isaiah Pacheco in Kansas City going behind Jameer Gibbs, uh, they're, they're going to be the guy at the goal line. They just are. 
Um, so that's probably like there are only so many things you could make the argument against Jameer Gibbs for, but that's probably the strongest bet is sheer volume and David Montgomery being a bigger back. Right. I mean, Gibbs is still going on average on the ESPN drafts. It, it's 6.5. So it's not like he's he's going yeah. ninth or something and I'm outraged by the whole thing. But I think there's an argument to be made of like, the optimistic side of Bijan versus what Jameer already did in the first year. But at the same time, like this is kind of going back to my original thing. It's like as much as we all like Jameer Gibbs, like Bijan was once a generational talent running back. So yeah. there's just no way that he can't. And I think that's why you're seeing him projected number three, uh, both on your projections and the overall stat projections going up there well, now. Well, you know this too, like, uh, like and not to, to sidetrack to basketball for a second, but like obviously you're all in on the, on the draft and you know it, like – I know that everybody loves like, hey, I want to know exactly where like so and so like, you know, where's Kyle Filipowski on your like, you know, one to 50 big board like you have him 27th. I had him 23rd. Like that's wild. You had him 27th or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 but right, it's right. I, I say this all the time. Like I think of players in fantasy as tiers, right? It's our buckets, whatever you want to call them. So like when I have Jameer Gibbs, I did like, you know, Christian McCaffrey probably is a tier unto himself. I expanded it a little bit to three running backs. But like sometimes when you're sitting there and you're like, gosh, this guy's like the fifth running back off the board, and that guy's the eighth. Like, that sounds like a big difference, but I'm kind of saying the same thing, which is, like, I have zero qualms if that guy's the number one running back on your team, and you should feel great about him every single Sunday. It's Again, this is not to, like, skirt responsibility if I get my picks wrong. It's more to suggest to people that there's so many times, like, I get questions on Sunday morning where it's like, you know, am I starting this guy or that guy? And I'm like, like, I, I flip a coin, right? Like, uh, my my job, I don't have like the, this crystal ball. That's not what a fantasy analyst is. It's to take as much information as we have and try to present it in like a neat and tidy way. But like a lot of times, like I'm talking to like my brother who's like, you know, got three kids and him and his wife work full time. So he's not sitting there during the week, like closely studying the uh, Jaguars practice report. So he doesn't know if like Christian Kirk's Q next to his name is like an actual Q or if he's like, hey, just a little bit dinged up and he's going to play. Like uh, Most of the time, people are looking for confirmation more so than they are looking for like a clear-cut answer between Terry McLaurin and Tyler Lockett in Week 8 based off their projections. Yeah, I mean, as much as I still listen to Sports Talk Radio, I would tell you that my least favorite content <laughs> in the world is the rapid-fire calls. Be like, all right, I have Givens and Frisman Jackson in one wide receiver spot <laughs> open. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, that's a like why right did there yeah. yeah all right okay so this this is good then because let's get a quick saquon thing in here because this also leads into the hurts conversation where hurts is still going to go top five as far yeah. as quarterbacks are concerned so i don't want to go all quarterback right now but there is a fascinating like well does hurts hurt barkley because yeah. i don't think they're going to stop doing the most successful single play in the nfl with the uh tush push whatever you want to call it yeah but at the same time like a healthy Barkley, like it's just going to be hard to pass on the idea of him being pissed and him being like ready to go. And I would say even without Kelsey feeling better about the offensive line, I mean, I don't know what you would say. Well, basically, I would say it's not even about an offensive line conversation between the Giants and the Eagles, especially when you look at the health of the Giants over the years, but not having any fear whatsoever about getting beat down the field or on the outside. Yeah. So even if you're you're trying to figure out the math of how many touchdowns is Barkley going to take from Hertz or is Hertz just going to still keep all of his, the field must it it the default of this is that at least there's other threats that Saquon has around him that he's not had with the Giants. Totally. It's like you got sep you got two separate gravitational forces. I'll I'll throw one more kind of into that argument you made about the rushing touchdowns because it's legit. Like if they have the ball, I was talking about how if the Lions have the ball first and goal from the one, like and they're handing the ball off to a running back, it's probably David Montgomery over Jameer Gibbs. For the Eagles, it's just let the quarterback just do what he does, which is be the best short yardage runner in the NFL. Um, and beyond that, if you look at Jalen Hurts so far in his career, and this tracks with a lot of guys who have been very, very good uh, rushing quarterbacks, they don't tend to throw the football off, throw the football to running backs as much because quarterback scrambles sort of offset dump off to the back, right? Like Brady or like even still in Tampa, like, Baker Mayfield, not a very mobile quarterback, but dumps the football off all the time, which is why Rashad White had this monster receiving season last year. By the way, that's a, that's a positive of Baker's game. It's not a negative. It's like good decision-making. Um, so you have the idea that Saquon probably won't be as involved in the passing game and the fact that he might not have as many rushing touchdowns from short yardage working against the fact that it's, I don't know, it's not the best offensive line in football. It's a decidedly better offensive line than anything he ever played behind in New York. 
And we've seen over the past couple of seasons, like Miles Sanders was like the third leading rusher in the NFL two years ago and had like a big touchdown season. Jalen Hurts can get his and the best running back in Philadelphia can get his as well. And maybe this is like too much of a narrative, but like, I don't think the Eagles paid all this money for a team that has totally devalued the running back position during Howie Roseman, their GM's tenure, to have Saquon come in and be like, you know, just a part of the running game. He should be the focal point, the entirety of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a brand new toy, and I would think you'd want to show it off there a little bit. Okay, let's talk wide receivers because we still have a lot of work to do here. Um, Give me your quick top five. And then I think there's like a big lingering question that I did some research on, so I'm excited about. So I know yeah. your five is a little different because it sounds like CD's the consensus one and you just flipped him with Tyreek, right? Yeah, I flipped him with Tyreek recently. And this is sort of a hedge right now. I, I sort of own this is that like if CD Lamb doesn't have a contract and it's August 28th as opposed to August 5th when you and I are talking right now, like at some point the possibility of him missing a game is there, right? And The Cowboys have gone down this road before. They famously did it with Zeke, who got the contract done like right before uh, week one. He was back on the field, and it was fine. Um, But we've seen these contract holdouts become a real trick for these wide receivers. Brandon Ayuk, CeeDee Lamb, still unsettled as of this moment. And it's not like Tyree Kill is like some slouch, right, obviously. But uh, CeeDee Lamb, if he got signed tomorrow, would flip back up. Because if you look at his last 11 games last season, it's like – historically ridiculous 134 targets in his final 11 games last year which that's a good number for a full season he did it in what two-thirds of a season so Tyreek CD I have Amon Ross St. Brown third which is different than where a lot of people land Jamar Chase Justin Jefferson who remind me of Saquon Barkley and uh, Jonathan Taylor in the sense that you could flip a coin on those guys Uh, Chase has a much better quarterback situation Jefferson has been largely quarterback proof and Sam Darnold or JJ McCarthy might be enough in an offense that kind of kept things moving last year with like Jaron Hall and Nick Mullins under center. Okay. So let's get to the Chase Jefferson conversation. And actually this research is from your latest episode. So um, you'll be familiar with it, but I thought that this was really telling because like you could feel a certain way about Chase and now you're thinking about Jefferson post cousins. Like how could you even make it debate? I mean, I personally like Chase better, but um, I know most people will tell me that I'm wrong, and that's totally fine. But when you look at Jefferson with Cousins, he's wide receiver number three. Without Cousins, he was wide receiver number eight. Chase with Burrow was wide receiver number seven. Without Burrow, wide receiver number 34. That kind of yeah. ends the debate of who you're going to take if they're both. If, if the other guys are gone and those two options, and you want a receiver, I don't know how you take Chase based yeah. on that, right. knowing that it's still, you know, a huge question mark about what's going to happen with a quarterback because it seems like with Jefferson, it's not going to matter. Yeah. That's fair um, because and, and if, if like Joe Burrow wasn't available, if you're concerned about Joe for some reason, like you would definitely right, that's default towards the other part of it, right? Jefferson. So. But yeah, I mean, I would say this too is that like I do look at the circumstances of the games in which Jefferson was without Kirk Cousins as opposed to when Jamar Chase was without uh, Joe Burrow. Like Cincinnati, uh, like not to get too much into like, you know, uh, environments and land and like uh, nature and uh, and 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 like uh, being the local meteorologist, but like Cincinnati playing in like cold weather games, grinded out games because their defense was good. Like, did it need did not need Jamar Chase to like have a bunch of vertical shots down the field? Like, he just they totally changed their offense with Jake Browning. Like, Joe is not going to be confused for Josh Allen as far as like strongest arm in the NFL, but can certainly push the football down the field. And the Bengals just didn't do that. Once Jake Brennan took over, it was pretty much all like at the line of scrimmage for Jamar Chase. So he had some high volume games, but they were not nearly as likely to see him go for 150 yards because unless he breaks a bunch of tackles, it probably wasn't happening. But this kind of comes down to like, again, the idea of if we were in court and I told you you had to be the Jefferson guy and I had to be the Chase guy, we'd both feel really good about our case. Yeah, because I I think there's... um... I mean, you're seeing Burrow take this hit now, too, with where he's being drafted, the names that I'll hear him about. But then again, yeah. you got to get back and remember the scoring, and that's what will lead to some of the conversation about the QBs. But let's uh, let's stay in the receivers here, because yeah. what do you do with the rookies? Because there's good, there's actually pretty solid history that we're talking the elite, elite first-rounders, the rookies, they're worth taking higher than the more established guys that maybe are always wide receiver number two. Or I shouldn't say wide receiver number two. I shouldn't maybe the number two option on a team with all of the skill guys and be like, well, okay, at least this guy's been playing four or five years. I know exactly what I'm getting as opposed to rookies. But history tells us these top flight guys deliver immediately. 
Yeah, at some point you start to like, you, you have to use process of elimination when you're trying to find guys that aren't like unimpeachable top seven or eight wide receivers, but are like pretty close with a question mark or two. And as I looked at Marvin Harrison Jr., the only question, and I have him as wide receiver nine, which when you uh, look at my, the rest of my colleagues at ESPN, I haven't tracked every single person, but uh, he, uh, outside, outside of ESPN, but his average rank amongst my colleagues is 13.3. So 4.3 slots, when you're talking about guys within the top 15 at any position, that's a big gap. So I have a wide receiver nine, and like the only question mark that I suppose you could ask for Marv is, can he get it done at the NFL level? I mean, you watch tons of college football, and you have known this player probably since his high school days. Like, yes, the answer is yes. And not just because of what we've seen, but because of what you alluded to, like rookie wide receivers coming out of the gates and being stars is a totally normal thing. We see it almost every single year. Puka Nakua, obviously, last year was the best. Garrett Wilson a couple of seasons ago. Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, the list goes on and on and on. Um, it's a really good opportunity for Marvin Harrison Jr. He is the clear-cut number one wideout for a team that I'm not going to do a Kyler debate right now. I think Kyler is good. How's that? Like, I think he's good enough that he can get the football to Marvin Harrison Jr. a lot, like maybe between 8 and 10 targets a game. And they are going to be, I think, an improved team, but I still think they could be fourth in their own division. They might have to throw the football a lot. So all those things make me feel really good about Marvin Harrison Jr. Weirdly having a high floor as a rookie, which is something that you don't normally say about rookies because of the fact that they have not, at the NFL level, had the chance to do it before. Uh, you've got Drake London um, as part of this Atlanta <laughs> reinvention 2.0 here. But yeah. I mean, the reality, too, is when you look at his target numbers, they're just not very high. He's not top 20 in targets. Um, so where do you have London? Yeah, he's, I think, 13 for me now, 13, 14, which is right in that, you know, that, that's not that far off. from. So it's like Marvin Harrison Jr. for me, Devontae Adams, Chris, uh, Mike, Michael Pittman Jr., Chris Olave, and then Drake London. Uh, he, yeah, it's, it's... So he's ahead of Neighbors and Adunze for you? He is, yeah. And those guys, and we can talk about Neighbors, you know, Adunze just because of the, the, the depth there, right? I mean, he could be their third best wide receiver in time. He won't be, but uh, with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore aboard, it's not crazy to think he'd be number three in the pecking order uh, there. but. Um, with Drake, it's like that he probably will feel the quarterback impact the most, right? Because beyond like, you know, even if Mariota and Desmond Ritter weren't good players, like it's not that hard to turn around and hand the football off to your running back, right? It does change the way that teams play defense against you. But for London, you know, 900 plus receiving yards last year and two touchdowns. Him and Chris Godwin were the only two players to reach at least 900 yards and have two or fewer touchdowns. Um, Eighth overall pick, you, mem- you remember his USC days, obviously. He was the offensive player of the year in the then Pac-12, and he got hurt on Halloween, which is what? That's like maybe 65 70% of the way through the college football regular season. That's how dominant of a player he was uh, during his final season there. So I still have, like, I continue to just, like, trust that this guy coming out was or is who I thought he was uh, in Atlanta now. So I am banking on, like, way more volume from one of the least past heavy offenses to probably one of the more past heavy offenses. If we assume the system is what Zach Robinson, their new OC coached under Sean McVay with in LA, or at least very close to it. So Drake London is, I mean, sometimes the chalky picks are boring, um, but he is one of the chalkier like breakout picks in this year's uh, not just wide receiver group, but really any player at any position. See, these are good, like battling theories in that, like, would you rather have Rome? as the potential three, although just the idea of you saying that sentence, because I love him so much, I'm like, yeah. well, that's, that's not going to be real. Yeah. Um, and who knows? I mean, Keeney could get hurt again. And then you have Caleb Williams, a quarterback, as opposed to what Neighbors is dealing with, even though he's going to be the guy that you're looking at every single time yeah. down the field. Um, I think another one of those, it's not the same theory, but the similar theory of like, would you rather have the clear number one option or would you rather have a really strong number two? Because clearly Stefan Diggs, yeah. who – if you look at it last year was ninth in scoring, I guess the bloom is off the rose a bit with him. Yeah, it is. He's, he's being projected to go around 20. And I don't know if that's because you think Nico takes away from his scoring, but again, it kind of gets back to is Diggs less of an option now because he's not the clear number one or should he still be, is 20 just too low for him considering, Hey, there's actually somebody else on the other side. That's a real option here. Yeah. Especially yeah, all- when you look at the depth of Houston in general. I've become sort of the, the, the Diggs guy amongst ESPN rankers. A lot of people have Nico Collins ranked ahead of him now, which is not like some crazy thought. Um, 
The question I would have, and I'm I, I'm not asking this rhetorically, I'm asking it seriously, is like Nico Collins had 120 targets last year. Like, do you think personally there's like a factoring in the addition of Stefan Diggs and the health now of Tank Dell, who missed a good chunk of last season? Like, do you yeah, I mean, he Nico missed Collins he missed almost be, well, not half, but yeah, I mean, Tank, chunk, should have, yeah. I should have brought him up earlier, so yeah. maybe that is baked into it even more that it's not just the other guy, it's Tank as well. So go ahead. Yeah, it seems like uh, Nico, like probably, like I don't expect him to jump from like 120 to like 150 targets this year. Do you? Um, no, I, I wouldn't think. I, I don't think they would want to be that predictable. I mean, what's yeah, the whole point of bringing too. Diggs in? Yeah, so I feel that way too. And so I think Diggs could, I think Diggs will lead the team in targets. And I think the number will be less than where it has been in Buffalo, which is like close to 160 to 170 per season over those four years. The number went up, obviously, when they go to 17 games. Um, and it could be maybe like 130 for Diggs, 135, which is still a big number, but that's why you get a bit of a Diggs discount. Is I, I would also say this, is that Nico Collins might have more games where he leads the Texans in receiving yards. Maybe he has the most games with 100 receiving yards amongst all Texans. I think Diggs, though, is going to just chew up targets. I'm not trying to make this so reductive, but if the Texans didn't feel like Diggs was still a very capable player who could fill a specific role, they wouldn't have traded for him. It wasn't a huge package they traded for him, but you know, for a guy, for a team that is about to become really, really expensive, like to acquire Stephon Diggs did require like some future planning and also like tightening the screws on other spots around the roster financially this year. I thought it was a sign that they feel like he could be the guy that kind of unlocks the next level for an offense that was really good last year when we all thought, at least I thought it was going to be really, really bad. Yeah, look, I know he slowed down a bit. I know he's not for everybody. He always seems to be upset after a certain amount of time, but he'll be, what, 31 this season? I on mean, a one-year deal. Uh, like, you think he's right, going to go down there right. and, and pout? Like, he's going to go down there, play with well, probably... Yeah, he, he might still pout. might, do, yeah. he might, he still might, might do that. But he's playing with the quarterback that, like, not obviously not Mahomes, but like he's on the short list, I would think, CJ Stroud of the guys that like players around the NFL now want to play with. They All just right, based on that guy. Looking at the scoring last year for quarterbacks, top five in scoring, Allen, Hertz, Dak, Lamar, and Jordan Love. Yep. Um, a couple different uh, things that I'm looking crazy. at here. G- yeah. Give me your give me your top five right now for 24. Uh so this is where I, I've probably generated the most pushback, but uh it is Josh Allen, no debate there. Jalen Hurts, Anthony and Richardson. And like, no debate, right? It's no that debate. far and away. Okay, all right. I mean, even in the last eight games when both Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis were up and down, Josh was just so far. I mean, he's just, he's literally, I mean, he's unbelievable. He's so good in every way that you need him to be good. For fantasy purposes, highest scoring player in the league each of the past two seasons. Uh, Anthony Richardson, three. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, four. Lamar Jackson, five. Richardson, obviously the one that people have been asking about a ton. Um, I'll be honest with you, like, I, I'm super optimistic about the player. Uh, just as like the the raw skill set, I know you know it, but like for as freaky as some of these guys like Josh and, and Jalen are, at, like physically, like Richardson might be just like a touch freakier, right? Six foot five, two hundred and forty four pounds at a four 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 forty. Like that's ridiculous. He played twelve quarters last year, twelve, and he still had four rushing touchdowns. Like the guy has all the right ingredients to be a fantasy superstar even if he's not a perfect passer right out of the gates Jalen Hurts had 16 16 passing touchdowns his first season as a starter which in today's NFL is nothing and he was still like one of the five best quarterbacks in all of fantasy football um it's not going to require Anthony Richardson to become this surgeon as a thrower overnight to be a fantasy superstar and yeah I'm optimistic on the player is a leap of faith for sure but uh, I just think that we, it's, I mean, if I if I told you I was quarterback three on Jalen Hurts a few years ago, people would have said you're nuts. So sometimes you got to get ahead of the curve. Okay. I think it's insane. Fair. <laughs> not the only person that's told me that. Uh, and you're not, in, you're not like completely on your own with this one because his average draft position is what, around five or six? Like yeah, I, I've heard yeah. other people say that, and <laughs> here's what I would offer up. Yeah. I understand that it's different with the scoring. Yeah. And that the rushing touchdowns are really attractive. But what I saw, and I went back and watched him this morning, is I see somebody that doesn't trust throwing at all. And yeah. he is so gifted. And I don't think the teams are entirely ready for it. Three of the, think the four touchdown runs are on draws that are yeah, defended Yeah, they are. They love the quarterback run. Yeah. Right. And at some point, you'd think the other team goes, we've got to keep someone in. And look, he still may win the one-on-one with a linebacker spying him anyway because he sure. is that gifted. And there's there's no debate on it. But if I'm sitting there again, we're just talking about fantasy. 
But the names that you're putting him ahead of after playing 12 quarters just because of the rushing part, which again, I still think like the rushing element is is really exciting, but it scares me when it feels like it's your default comfort setting and he hasn't played enough for that. Like is all of a sudden now he's going to feel like, oh, I don't have to go to this. I think he went to that stuff because they were really worried about the limitations of anything else they could try to do with him. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's fair. Uh, so when I'm ranking, I think there's like a little bit of a different methodology at certain portions of the rankings. Like I feel good at the top of the board about imagining the upside of the player, right? Uh, it's not, if, if, if I'm just looking for the floor of a guy, my one through 10 would feel differently. When I get to like, maybe like RB15 to RB25, I am much more mindful of the floor and not just the upside because that position can get ugly in a hurry as I was talking about earlier. But for the quarterbacks, like the idea here with Richardson is Lamar's unbelievable. He's actually weirdly been the player that I've gotten the most pushback. Like, hey, you should have Lamar ahead of Richardson. Over the past, if you go look at the last three seasons in which Lamar has been the NFL's MVP during one of them, I look at like 20 points as an arbitrary high scoring week for a quarterback. If you go back and look at the number of games in which Lamar has scored at least 20 points, and I, I had, of course, I had this written down. I don't have a piece of paper that I had it written down on. The number is a lot lower on like a percentage basis than you might expect. Lamar has been, even by his own standards, like a little bit more up and down over the past three years than you might realize as a fantasy quarterback. So another reason why Josh Allen is so unique is because he's so darn consistent in that regard. But that's my idea with Richardson. is like the possibility of every single week because of the rushing upside to get the 20 points might be as high as any quarterback not named Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts. I would argue it is as high as any quarterback not named those two guys. Okay. Let's talk about this poor guy, Mahomes. Um, <laughs> his average, what? His average draft position is worth seven or eight right now? Uh, I think it's higher than that. I think it's up to like quarterback four. I, have, I can pull you Oh, it right is? Now. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Mahomes' name's value, like, I'm surprised it's actually not higher than that. Like for a while and you know, value-based drafting, like think about like running backs in the real NFL draft going like top 10. Uh, Patrick Holmes, actually, how about this? This is ESPN's ADP. And the, I remind people all the time, this stuff is subject to change. But right now it's number one amongst quarterbacks, 28.3 overall. That's oh, insane. Oh, so he, he's number one on the C, C. There has not been one. There's not been one projection where I've seen him, I think, in anybody's top three. He's not. Two things can be true at once. Patrick Mahomes would be the best player on the planet by a long shot right now. Well, and right, taking right, him ahead I, of Josh right. Allen is completely insane. Which, yeah, I don't want to uh, relitigate the NFL top 100 as one of the no. players. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mahomes at going first ahead of Josh Allen, like, again, just... Yeah, we, we're like, on the same page. It's nuts. I, yeah. I guess I felt like I was seeing his projections yeah, lower. His ranking is lower than that. Like he right. is a fairly frequent quarterback four, quarterback five, maybe even quarterback six for people that are CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson optimists. It's insane is, though. Is that Mahomes. a multi year thing though? Because I mean, the argument for Mahomes is he just yeah. came off arguably his worst statistical season that he's ever had. I mean, yeah. the QBR is the worst of his career, right. the yardage is the second lowest. His touchdowns are the second lowest and yep. the second lowest to a season where well, I think he was at 27 touchdowns and I still think he only had like five picks and last year's double digit picks. It feels like even though we are all on the same page about who he is and how horrifying he is and if you just pick the Chiefs for the next five years, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but I'd say statistically in relation to what we're actually talking about, this is the worst he's ever played. Yeah, it really was. So he had three games last year, amazingly, with 20 plus fantasy points in 2023, which tracks based off of how frustrating what was 20, last... Can you look up 22? Yeah. So going back in the, the starter, the seasons he was a starter for a full-time mm -hmm. basis, three last year, prior years, 12, 12, 13, <laughs> yeah, six, which that was a year in which he missed three games. He got hurt early against Denver on a Thursday night. So only six, but you know, not great, but still. 12, 12, 13, six, and 13 is the five years prior to last season. So... Uh, you know, not to make this, um, not to like make these players like faceless and anonymous, but you're you're betting on you're betting on repeatable acts in fantasy football, and you're sort of like hedging against extremes. And the extremes suggest that Patrick Mahomes having the year he did last year is very unlikely. Like he's he's too good. And if you if it was like just a fantasy football playoffs, a fantasy football game pertaining to the playoffs, like they looked a little closer to what we think they'll be in the playoffs, which is part of the reason why they won, again, 
They've reloaded. Um, it feels like there's a weird pressure taking off Kansas City this year because they just proved they can do it without being this elite offense. Very optimistic about Mahomes having just a ridiculous season once again. All right, we've got a bunch of stuff here and only a few more minutes, so let's try to run through it. If I'm punting on a quarterback, if I'm going yep. like, look, I need a top guy and I want to try to get one of those top five tight ends, Give me some names. Give me three names. Yes, there's an awesome second-tier quarterback. Stack, who's going in the eighth round right now on ESPN, who's been a top-eight quarterback for the past five seasons. Uh, I would argue that Kyler Murray's in that category as well. Again, not trying to sit here and debate Kyler's like you know overall rank uh, in real-life terms, but the guy is an awesome fantasy quarterback and is in a good system for him. Brock Purdy, who maybe doesn't have quite as much upside every single week because he doesn't really run, but Brock Purdy plays in an amazing system for fantasy points. Jaden Daniels is a wild card. He's the most interesting one. I know I don't have to tell you about the brilliance of Jaden Daniels last season. Um, Athletically, though, you just don't see players come around like that at that quarterback spot all that often. He is going super late, too. His name might push him up the board to be closer and closer to drafts, but you could wait to like the 10th round and get Jaden Daniels. Jordan Love in that same category, too. So that's a lot of names. The point is, there's nothing wrong with Josh Allen early, Jalen Hurts early, but if you decide to wait, you're in a good spot. Top five tight ends scoring last year, Laporta, Ingram, Kelsey, yeah. Hawkinson, and then Kittle. Um, I'm going to throw one at you. And it wasn't like, I think he was still 10th in scoring, but Dalton Kincaid. He had only yeah. two two touchdowns, but he had 91 targets. It's a And it's again, it's a carryover of loving him in college. But I would think as you look at the depth chart of receiver and a lot of hope for Keon Coleman, I would be surprised if Kincaid is not a more targeted player and somebody that ends up in the end zone a lot more to even creep up into that top five scoring. Totally. One of the better uh, breakout picks for this season. And while uh, Keon Coleman, you know, obviously was taken with a first pick of the second round, um, you know, player I liked in college has some, some real obvious strengths and some limitations, which is why he went in the second round. Um, as much as there's excitement around surrounding him, as I think more and more, or as I thought more and more about the Bills plans this off season, like they are, Traded Stephon Diggs. Like they made, they, they, they willingly had to agree to make that move. They allowed Gabe Davis, which I thought was a good business move, to walk away. Um, allowed him to go to Jacksonville for three years, 39 million bucks. I think the Bills are saying to themselves, it's less about like which wide receiver that we acquired steps up. I think it's more about the belief that Tulson Kincaid can become a major dude. And also Khalil Shakir, who, you know, a guy that has had some bright moments for them, I think will play a bigger role then maybe he is currently forecasted to play maybe outside of Buffalo. It seems like there's a lot of momentum and support for him amongst the local beat. But Buffalo's answer might just be that, like, we don't need a true number one wide receiver. We just need a bunch of really solid players. And maybe the best out of those solid players is Dalton Kincaid. Okay. Um, Give me uh, a few sleepers in general. And then I have one last question. I actually did. I, I put together a full list of one from every single team. I, here's, let me just, it's not a qualifier. It's just like for if, if you're out there 32? listening and you're like, yeah, we were thinking about doing something for uh, for our show in the next few days here. Uh, sleepers are no longer names of players that you've never heard of, right? Like it's not guys that you have, been, wow, like I've, <laughs> I've, I've never, you know, like that used to be a thing when I was growing up. It'd be like, you know, the Saints third wide out where you're like, wait, never heard of that guy. Let me go check them out. It's guys that you've heard of. It's also just that they're being drafted really low. Michael Wilson in Arizona is a name that of a guy that I think is going to be a good player. I think Dylan Lobby uh, from uh, University of New Hampshire, now with the Raiders, is going to play a bigger role than people realize. And that's like a good deep cut right there. Like you might Here be familiar go. with him of the you know, obviously our roots uh, from you know same home state, uh, but also like a guy that I think is going to have a legit role uh, pretty soon. Tyrone Tracy from uh, from the the Giants also should you know could have a legit role there with Devin Singletary as the guy. Uh, a name people probably already know, like Josh Downs from the Colts is kind of not being talked about right now. And he was a real factor for them last season. He had like a stretch of seeing like eight targets a game for a while. And it seems like he's the number two, at least in my estimation there, which uh, if I'm optimistic about Anthony Richardson, it's not just because of the running. It has to be about some of the players around him as well. So those would be some names. And then quarterback, again, everybody knows every quarterback, but Will Levis to me is the obvious, like if this guy takes a step, He's got so many of the ingredients to be a fantasy football star, even if he's not a perfect quarterback in real life. Dylan Lobby get a doctorate there at UNH or what? I think he, he was there for a long time, man. I think he's 24 already. Okay. Um, he was good, though. He is. He Fun is player to watch. Yeah. Love his profile pick, though. That's right up there. I mean, that's oh right up there God. with the field. That's like a field Yates special right there. All yeah. neck. All, All right. right last, last thing. Give me um, 
because this is a, let me use an example first. Things that you're paying attention to. Okay, you're okay. a couple weeks in, things are falling apart, you've got the bad injury luck. But like when I look at Herbert and some of the rankings right now, it seems yeah. like everyone's scared off because of Harbaugh's approach to football. Like, yeah. oh, he's going to run, he's going to run. And, and granted, the, the turnover that we've seen at receiver as well, even though there was this time with the Chargers, I was just so in love with all of their skilled guys. I know. Like even their yeah. fifth option in the passing game. I even started to choke up a little bit even thinking about it, but it just didn't work <laughs> out for him. Um, but I, I heard you talk about, I've heard others talk about this, like this is actually being oversold now because even if you're the most run-happy offense in the NFL, Baltimore last year ran it more than anybody else, just a hair under 50% of their plays. Like nobody's yeah. going to come into this going – you know, Nebraska in the 90s on totally. this in today's NFL. I mean, Cincinnati barely runs the football. Kansas City, I, they're like, you know, 40% running the football. But even last year, and that's because of Lamar that you have yeah. Baltimore. It just basically every other play is a rushing play, and maybe they creep up. But I feel like it's – I know that it's, it's, it's more than that and the draft pick not working out, all this kind of stuff. But – that's something I would look at where I'm going to watch the game and go, maybe Herbert is completely overlooked here because he's still, I think, a top five talent in the position. Give me something that you're thinking about. Yeah, so he's like, he, he just has nuclear ability that it's like, wow, if Justin Herbert just plays off the charts, like nobody was, and the, the narrative has changed now, but nobody was sitting here last year like, C.J. Stroud is loaded with weapons around him, right? Like prior to last season, Nico no. Collins had never had 500 yards in a season, much less what he did during the 2023 year. So I do think it's important for us to remember that like a lot of times, like a, a, a freak quarterback can overcome the situation around him. That'd be a good example. I would say right now, like something that I am monitoring is the backs that I don't feel crazy inspired about as the starter, who are more the starter by default than they are, I think, like by ability. And what, if any, indicators we're getting about the players right behind them? So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Zamir White in in, La in Las Vegas. Like, I think he's a fine player. I don't think he's like a clear-cut, indisputable, like has to be the number one guy for the Raiders for the full season. I mentioned Zach Moss earlier for the Bengals. Could Chase Brown, who I liked coming into the draft last year out of Illinois, ends up dropping to the uh, sixth round. Um, like that's, a, I think, a capable enough back backup where you're like, all right, hey, so... Uh, and the, the the analogy that I'll draw to last year was Alexander Madison, who everybody was like, yeah, he's the guy now, right? Like Minnesota, like kept him. Uh, by the way, I, I am including myself in this in this conversation. Uh, they let Dalvin Cook walk, and I kept being like, yeah, you know, they gave him real money. And then it was like, wait, they gave him two years and seven million bucks. Like, I mean, more than yeah. nothing, right? But like, two years, seven million dollars is not like enough. Like, they're not they're not putting him on scholarship at that level, right? Like. They're not required to make a man the entire season. And he ended up having a very mediocre year, especially relative to expectations. So I'm keeping my eyes on the guys that I'm not totally sold. Like in an all things being equal world would be starting running backs and how the backups are either looking slat or like if, if there's at least a clear cut number two, if it's like he got three guys behind him, I'm a little bit less interested. That is Field Yates. Uh, it's great to catch up again. I the Fantasy you. Focus podcast. Uh, and you guys, you guys go five days a week, five days a week, man. A lot of content, a lot of content, a lot of content, yeah. big numbers. I remember looking at the charts and looking at the numbers in the fall. I'd be like, damn it. They're smoking me. <laughs> Come on. You're an institution. <laughs> You're an institution. You don't have to worry about the numbers. Uh, thanks my man. Appreciate you. You want details? Fine. I drive a Ferrari 355 Cabriolet. What's up? I have a ridiculous house in the South Fork. I have every toy you can possibly imagine. And best of all, kids, I am liquid. So, now you know what's possible. Let me tell you what's required. Life advice, boys. The email address is lifeadvicerr at gmail.com. Team USA hat Kyle. So, Rudy, I got to tell you, your hat, if you look at it wrong. I know. <laughs> I've had multiple people be like, what's going on with this? It's the number one. It's a number one. Uh, it also is, though, a USA hat. So, Kyle and I both... Nice. Uh, out here being super patriotic. What's up? Good stuff. I was passing through a lids uh, this weekend, and I was just like, "Lids, look at that!" Yes. It was like tw it was like twenty eight dollars. There was like a, some sort of a, a, a discount, and uh, grabbed that right away. Great hat. It's white. Would have paid fifty eight for that. Right, that is a good one. That's what I thought. Yeah, I, I went into really... a lids like a couple months ago because I I like just walked by. I was like, "Man, lids are still around the mall. This is incredible." And there was like that fitted 
Mariners, like navy blue hat with like the teal brim. And I was like, man, am I going to drop 40 bucks on this right now? Like maybe <laughs> my wife looked at me. I was like, yeah, are you going to wear it? I'm like probably like, you know, but so I, I left it at the store, but I really wanted to get it. And I was like, I was surprised Lids was still a thing. I didn't know they were still in business. Shout out to Lids. This was actually, I was in a Lids locker room. I guess they're expanding to where like they have like jerseys and, you know, a lot of Lids will have like something, I guess. But like this was more, less hat focused and more uh, other stuff. So um, yeah, I spent quite a bit Lids of time locker room. Okay. checking that clearance wow. rack. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I would say yes on the Mariners thing because the right 5950 fit is incredible i'm a big fan of it but i'll tell you when you're traveling and you have a hat from st louis on and then the sheer disappointment that is met when it's like are you from st louis be like no you know the blue jays one i had an excuse because of bushman so i had the blue jays gear and it was kind of my post mookie bets boycott and then i just started getting a little more aggressive with the different hats because i always liked that red cardinals hat but then i always liked the pittsburgh one your pirates guy i was gonna say yeah yeah, and now I'm like, you know, I was like, oh, Paul Skeens. It's like, no, it isn't. She just, just like the hat, but I don't want to have to explain. He's a big Libby like, Dunn guy. We all know that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's actually because of her. <laughs> <laughs> I should just start saying that. Like, I really like LSU, and uh, are you familiar with gymnastics? <laughs> um, all right, so let's get to a couple here. Wait, we uh, should. This, this is, has got me thinking, though. We should. We should do the. Because we've been thinking about like stupid content ideas for the YouTube channel. We should just do like the tiers yes. list of baseball hats. We should just do that. That'd be fun. Because yeah, I would argue the should. Giants a, are up there. San Francisco's hat's incredible. Cardinals hat is incredible. Pirates hat is incredible. You know what? Look, the Yankees is a is a one of one. So I can say it, mm. even though it it just caused inner rage whenever I would see it at the wrong place. Like some guy showing up to whiskeys on Boylston. Fucking late nineties wearing a Yankees hat. You're like, fuck you doing, man. <laughs> um <laughs> whiskey's where your night went to die when you lived in Boston. Um, but it was it was a local spot for for our boys on Hereford. So yeah, um I think the Yankees hat is is a one you know what? Let's just save it. Let's just save yeah, it. Yeah, this is good content here. That's a really good idea. I mean, it's not the most I, I basically people just tearing shit to death now for about five, ten years, right? Yeah, Let's tears get in cool. on it like for tears. the crash. We should tear the tears. That's what we really should do. <laughs> <laughs> Sandoz QB tier would be the number one. It'd be in its own tier. It's, yeah. it's Patrick Mahomes. Field Yates fantasy tiers, obviously, would be you know up there as well. Yeah, but it wouldn't be Sandoz. No, but I'm saying Field Yates. Fan- it's it's probably a, a good what? Because what well, there's S tier, A tier, B, right? So it'd be A, yeah. Yeah, Brock Purdy. What's S tier again? Isn't S tier like the, best, the god right? tier? Yeah, that's the best yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah, because when I had those two 14-year-olds staying with me for two weeks, everything was fucking S tier. And then <sighs> yeah. mid, and, and we'd just be walking down the street, and he'd be Riz? like, NPC. So it's got NPC. that Riz. They, just, they would just point to dudes and be like, NPC. Like, NPC. what are you guys doing? Sounds like a great time. <laughs> Have you heard of that? We're getting way off on a tangent here, but there's some there's a lot of really be back. stupid... There's a lot of really stupid Gen Z stuff out there, but have you ever heard of the thing called the Coin Boys? Where yeah, literally I love these the guys, boys. That's, they just that's an old coin. thing. How do- <laughs> is it? I don't know. I just saw a bunch of like high school kids that were just <laughs> Wait, flipping coins for every decision in their life. I expected to be completely blind on this. How do I? No, the first time I read about the Coin Boys, I wanted to have them on the pod. I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Wait, so do like, you know about we, the we, Coin Boys? Kyle, I think this is yeah. No, I heard shit. about this like it like probably at least a year or two ago. Yeah, so it's not it's not brand new, but yeah, kind of unlocks up in my brain there. Uh, Look, I if I if, hearing about it, it, it could have just been repurposed. I mean, that's if I see another fucking post on Twitter about how to eat in pomegranate, you know, like no, did you know this? Be like Jesus Christ, it's like these three foreign people. <laughs> they're not chicks. They keep posting the same shit over and over and over again. If I have to see that guy's dick again on the pole vault. It's like, I got it. Yeah, that's it's, heavy it's, rotation. You, yeah. you know, like, and then somebody Congrats bounces him, out. Yeah. I saw it on three FanDuel days later. Today. FanDuel's Twitter did it today. <laughs> I yeah, mean, FanDuel's that's, aggressive. Everyone wants a piece. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> FanDuel is a, an aggressive posting corporation and a great partner. Yes. Yeah. They're just, you know, they're, they're less afraid they than everybody else. Yeah. I'll, it, my new favorite thing may be this on, uh, on X. Earnest replies. 
just earnest replies of somebody that felt the need to fucking reply. And it also, I think, speaks to how lonely everybody is. Most people. Or I should just say a lot. Maybe not. I shouldn't say everybody. But there was a post of, and I've already seen the post a hundred fucking times in the last couple of years. But it's this hotel room where it's like open, it's like glass on most of it. So it's not like a standard hotel room. It looks like it's cut into the Alps. And then the whole front is just window and it's gorgeous. And then the post has all of this snow going past it, right? But the candles are lit. There's a fireplace. The bed is about as comforting as you can imagine. I don't know if there's a bear rug in there. Who knows? It's got fucking everything you could possibly want. I'm swearing a lot. I'm sorry. And someone posts, could you live here? Now, the person who posted does not care whether or not you could live there. They just want people to answer. Engagement. Right. And someone sees it and is motivated to go, hmm, could I? And I just go, I'm going to look. I'm going to look. And a guy was like, I don't know. I'd have to do a lot of shoveling. <laughs> yeah, where's the nearest grocery store? <laughs> What's the walk score like? Imagine yeah. that being your dad or Are your boyfriend. Are any of those people real, though? I don't know what's I, real. I what's think not, it was. You know, I, well, I think a lot of it isn't real, Suri, so you're right about that. But I would then went and looked at the profile, and I think it was just a regular guy. Like, imagine being like, hey, can you, can you help us move some of the garbage bins around? Hold on. I have to post this about the snowy hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask the hypothetical question that I can't yeah. refuse. <laughs> so I may just start retweeting earnest responses do to it. all engagement. <laughs> Definitely <farming>. do it. <laughs> or maybe As I'll just anyone... start answering all of them earnestly. It would be better you if should. you became an earnest answerer. Yeah. That would be the best version of this. Wait. I did it on Instagram a week ago. There was a guy. Apparently, there's this page about sticks. And this guy's. Oh, I'm like, in on the he, stick page. Right. He reviews sticks. Yeah. And he picked up a stick on a path in the woods and he like held it three different ways and was like, hey, you could do this with it, <laughs> do this with it. And I couldn't help myself. I just posted a lot of uses. Can I say that just made me think of something else? The post that you had, first off, if you did that, people are already super confused about your socials. I feel like no one ever knows if it's real or not real. And I always say it's, it's not real, really at all, especially on Instagram. But you had my mom super confused about that athlete post with the guy holding the cigarette at the bullfight. <laughs> She's like, she had no idea. She had called me. She's like, what is this post from Ryan? And I was like, it's just a joke, mom. I don't, I, I, I don't Sorry. even know how to start explaining this to you. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And then like three hours later, it's like Angelus Rudy. Like, like, of course. You don't even get it, but you liked it. I liked that she thought about it for three hours and then she was, <laughs> she was in. My fear was I didn't want to actually post live footage from a bullfight because I imagine then I would, that has to be against the, the law. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe there's moments of the bullfight that you could post, but look, the bullfight recap will be in the Spain travel pod. But it is, um, it's gruesome. But I went. I experienced it for you, so you don't have to. Um, but I am glad I went, if that makes any sense. I'm kind of conflicted mm. on, on how I felt about the whole thing. All right, let's, uh, speaking of things being worked on here, uh, this is one of the most aggressive titles ever, so let's just do it. Should I let a weird gym bro perform my vasectomy? <laughs> Stats, 37 years old, 6'2", 180, no impressive gym stats. More on that later. Pro comp, Ronnie James. I hustle and work hard in D. Shoot a lot of threes, but Mary, uh, rarely make them in a perpetual slump. 37 years old, just had my third child, so I'm looking to finally get snipped. Should be pretty straightforward, but I'm in a little bit of a dilemma. Some background. I have an HMO medical plan, which limits the doctors I can see. I've been assigned to a specific <laughs> urology group and need to schedule a consultation with them. The consulting doctor will also perform the vasectomy. I work regular hours as a dentist, so I don't have much time off, but I do have every other Friday off, is which when I usually schedule all my appointments. When I call to schedule my consultation, I found out the only doctor available on Fridays is Dr. Jimbro. Not his real name. I've been going to a local CrossFit gym now for over 10 years, and Dr. Jim Bro is a regular there with me in the mornings. I don't have impressive gym stats to share. I usually do CrossFit two, three times a week just to stay fit and maintain my health. I never push myself too hard and don't put in any work outside of the gym, i.e. diet, due to having three kids in four and a half years and rarely getting a good night's sleep. Dr. Jim Bro, on the other hand, is one of the strongest and most intense guys in the gym. 
He deadlifts so much the bar bends. The issue is we have very awkward and cold relationship. I'm friendly with almost everyone at the gym except for him. We never speak or even say hi. After so many years, it's become so awkward that we generally avoid eye contact. See, that's hilarious is that it's just built and built for no other reason than just no reason. You think it's awkward now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, one recent example, his wife who was also friendly and had kids around the same time as us saw me after my third child was born. She was genuinely excited and motioned for Dr. Jimbro to come over and congratulate me. He walked by grunted. Yeah, I know. And walked <laughs> away without even looking at me. It's that sort of thing. Most of us at the gym ask about each other's families and careers, but he has no interest in me. I see. It's not a big deal during workouts since there are usually 15 to 30 people there. Is there anything? I mean, this guy seems pretty straightforward. Maybe he's just mad that you're, you've are you got this nice frame at 6'2", and you only weigh 180. Maybe that, maybe he's just disappointed maybe. in you. But I'm not. I mean, you've got a great career. You've got three kids by 37. You get every other Friday off. And you're still doing CrossFit. So you know how we feel. You don't, when you, if you're showing up, you can't be judged. Um, the problem is he's the only doctor I can see for the rest of the year. While I'm not weird about the vasectomy thing, being a dentist, I get it little different but yeah, yeah i think it i think in the medical profession all of them in general are just so desensitized to the stuff that us normies yeah. would be weirded out by it. so um i can say it's a little different but i actually should just not say that and agree with the dentist like i get it um although if i were a chiropractor as opposed to a proctologist and i was a member of a golf course like yeah i think it would be a little different but whatever um <laughs> I still feel uncomfortable interacting with him any further. Should I bite the bullet and schedule with him for convenience or should I take time off work and reschedule my patients to see a different urologist? For what it's worth, I've heard from the medical community that he's one of the best and you'll be up and running after a few days without any problems. I've heard some bad experiences during the recoveries from friends who want to avoid this if possible. Obviously. Uh, other relevant info. There's never been any sexual chemistry between his wife and me. She's friendly with everyone. Are you better looking okay. though? Maybe he's five, nine and balding. <laughs> Come on, man. I have a full head of hair. <laughs> no way. He's not the warmest person to others in the class, except for a few guys he consistently works out with who I'm also friendly with. I can't think of any significant incidents between us. long email. Well worth it. Incredibly thorough, by the way, because then the notes at the end, he gave us, he gammons us, he gave us news and notes, diamond notes at the end, mm. um, some rapid fire. Derek Barton hope. So, uh, wow. I don't know that I have a quick answer. I think the easiest one is how can you not like schedule it a couple months from now on a Wednesday if March you don't want to use this guy? Yeah. No, well, I mean, sure, I get your point, the March Madness vasectomy package from Vegas, but you're a dentist and I know it's impossible to get appointments and all that kind of stuff, but like you can't you can't move around a Wednesday a couple months from now to avoid this guy because clearly you don't want him to do it however what if what if this guy's pole the, vault hung? the ultimate icebreaker doesn't it seem like like you're talking about yeah. oh man i just can't get anything more than a grunt and passing from this guy this might be the ultimate icebreaker it could i think you would think if someone performs a vasectomy on you and you're at the crossfit place three times a week at the same time that should be as you said the icebreaker or a new chance of bond however if you're six two full head of hair he's five nine he's balding and you're looking like the Italian pole vaulter. Was that guy Italian, Sturdy? French, I think. No. Is he French? French? Yeah, I think he was French. Tough, okay, yeah, whatever. Tough one there, but yeah. Yeah, well, next time. Um, <laughs> what <laughs> if... Some lose some. Yeah. I mean, what if... He might hate this guy even more. Right. That's well, true. There's a big... This, yeah. it, see, it sounds like our guy's doing all the comparing. He, he doesn't know what's inside this man's head. Uh, he's like almost like... Maybe he's outwardly inwardly jealous of me because he's bald and short and i'm luscious and tall like i, I mean it's, it sounds it's 10 like years guy, 10 years they've been at this yeah maybe he's War. just not a friendly guy maybe he's just got like the 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 persona of like a woodshop teacher i mean whatever those guys those guys have friends too maybe he's just a little you know he's a little bristly that's that's okay i don't know i'd say i'd say i wouldn't overthink this but again i'm not well it's too I'm late for line. that yeah I'm, he's definitely what would you do Saruti? go what would you do well, I, just to circle back, I mean, him, when you had your third kid and his wife was like basically begging him to just say like, hey, congrats. And he just was a total asshole about it. Like something is it's not just nothing. Yeah. Something's there. Something's amiss. I would um, 
I am notorious for, I avoid all awkward interactions and I would just reschedule with somebody else. I don't care what the time is. Be careful in your, you know, sexual endeavors until the time being through there. And I would just, even if it was like a year later, I would just avoid this guy like the plate. No doubt about it. HMOs, man. That's why I'm on a PPO. Don't want to, don't want to be in this situation. <laughs> I'll tell you what would be great. It would be a blessing is a fourth kid who turns out to be awesome and he's your favorite kid. And it's like, had I gotten along with the guy from the gym, fad here would have never happened. <laughs> he's my ticket. He's my ticket. Uh, guy's on tour. Six, four, full head of hair. <laughs> Fucking unlimited possibilities for our fourth kid. Uh, I think we all kind of agree there's no flexibility. I know the dentists have a tough, tough schedule and all this kind of stuff. But if he's the best, I don't know. Maybe look, maybe the best part of this is that you don't care. Maybe that's the win. Is you go, all right, you know what? You want to be a dick for a decade straight for whatever reason where I've done nothing. I believe our emailer here, okay? I've done nothing to provoke this cold. But I'm telling you, guys can be weird. There was a guy, it was Tom Angle at ESPN. All right. Do you remember him, Saruti? He worked on college no. game day. He was like this legendary pitcher in high school, like legendary. Okay. And he worked um, on the game day crowd. And one time he and I like walked past each other. And I don't even know if that it was a size up. It was probably more on my deal. And he kind of looked at me and then put his head down. And then I was like, all right. And then the next few encounters we had, no one said anything to the other guy. So I remember going to Stanford, Steve. I was like, fuck that guy. He was like, dude, Tom. He's like, he's great. <laughs> I was like, he's great. Was like, he didn't like me. I'm like, it's just classic, like radio, TV, second class citizen, all the stuff. Why are those guys here? Are they grabbing pretzels? Desmond Howard's pissed. Priscilla's looking for a pen. Like, you know, what's, what's the point? And then randomly after a few years of this, I, I don't know how it happened. It could have been a beer or two where we were both at the same thing because we traveled with TV all of those years where he just started talking. And I think he was kind of shy, maybe. And I and it just it turned into something where he was probably thinking like, oh, Rosillo's a dick. Like he's yes. not going to say hi to me. And it, it started from nothing. It, there was nothing that could even happen. And, and he turned out to be one of my favorite guys that worked on on stuff at ESPN. Kind of my not, point not that I had whole time. Yeah. I would say though, Ryan, again, saying this with love, your neutral interactions sometimes can be hostile and like they can come yeah, off the wrong way. So yeah, you know, being yeah. neutral, like I, I could see that happening because that used to happen to me in college sometimes too. Where like, you know, you, you wouldn't be friends with somebody, but you'd see them walking in the, you know, in the quad or they'd have a couple of class with them, but you don't actually know them, but you just kind of judge them based on like the limited information that you have. That ha that, I, that happened a lot. Um, and then you meet them in so real life. Like, yeah, same. why did I think this guy was a tool? He's actually awesome. Like, he's great at beer pong. Like, he's awesome. Good partner. What's up? But <laughs> he's good at beer you, pong. Yeah, I mean, what you else specifically? You? I just know that there's like you're kind of cold at the start, even though you don't mean to be. You're just kind of doing the Rosillo like Hardo thing, and I think that intimidates and probably puts people off if it's not like a friendly first encounter. <laughs> Terrified a couple years ago. Terrified this guy. Right <laughs> there, here. you go. You were Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Come you're on, you're man. a little bristly too. I mean, you know, you've got that shop teacher vibe too when you come in there and you're like, all right, let's just <laughs> fucking get in and get out. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Where's my fucking shoes? I know. Hey, the shoes <laughs> being stolen. <laughs> I'm, all right, all right. Well, yeah. it, was a, it was a bad time for me at the ringer. <laughs> Sounds like liquid swords here. <laughs> uh, it was a bad time for me at the ringer. There were, there were cells. <laughs> and there magically, cells. magically, when when there were there were certain members against me, a pair of seven hundred dollar New Balances that were sent to me from StockX just disappeared. Because we both know we there. both know what happened is the wrong person saw my name on a box, opened it, and went, "Fuck that guy." Nice. They don't even know you, <laughs> or, you know. Or, or Kyle's been wearing them for four years. Are you twelve? <laughs> what size are you? I am a twelve. Oh fuck, man! I uh -oh. could have got away with that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Because they were there. Out. I've never owned a pair of New Balances or stole a pair of New Balances. I remember asking Liz. I was like, Liz, did the delivery show? And she's like, yeah, it's right here. It's like, great. She's like, your name's on it. Bob. I'll put it over to the side. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know bad, what to say. It was man. a bad time for the Empire. Okay. Uh, 
Another one was the word. Yeah, but Kyle, I even I even sent Kyle a text from Spain just telling him I missed him. Hell yeah. Bonded. That was a true bond right there. Yeah, I was like, let me bond with Kyle real quick here. I'm thinking about him. Draft beers. All right, 24 years old. Am I TikTok famous? 6'2", 215, gym stats, max bench 305, max squat 365. Can run under a seven-minute mile if I want it. I don't want to. <laughs> Is under a seven-minute mile a huge brag? I always thought it was under six, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think it is. I don't and think under run, I don't, in gym class people are going to be talking about it. I think. Yeah, if you he's twenty four. He's two fifteen. Oh, that's Should a good I, time. I would tell you about it if I did, if I did it this weekend. I'd yeah, be but I don't think that. you'd do it. Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't but, want to. Just like this guy. Uh, I'm going to hold firm here. I don't think under seven is maybe. Look, if he's just rounding out the stats the way other people tell us. Yeah. So let me let me retract what I I don't think it's, I think a, it's brag, a good time. But I don't. But I. I don't know that he's bragging. I think he's just giving us the full scope of who he is. So right. let's keep it there. All right. Okay. I can't wait to get emails. Be like, oh, you don't think? Let's see. You For the don't. record. Okay. I think sub seven is a good time. All right. Uh, basketball comp. If Giannis had a Steve Nash body type, <laughs> that's really good. Uh, <laughs> because Nash trying to play like Giannis, I don't know. I'm reaching out because I built up a following about 80,000 on TikTok. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. I guess so. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Where I create NBA and WNBA content focused on low lights with voiceovers. Uh oh. I'm at a bit of a crossroads, though, and I'm not sure how to really capitalize on this audience. TikTok's algorithm doesn't always ensure that your followers see your content. It would make it tricky to leverage a large following effectively. Some videos do really well and some videos don't perform at all. Financially, I've had some success. Some months I've earned an extra 5000 while others bring in just a couple hundred bucks. I also had a sponsorship for a few months during the NBA season that contributed another grand per month. Currently, I have a full-time job and treat this as a fun side project. I'm curious if there's a way to take things to the next level, become TikTok famous, or will this always just be a side gig? I don't know anything about any of that stuff. I got banned from TikTok after one post about, <laughs> I think it was Matt Liner <laughs> explaining something about Caleb Williams. I posted, it, I've been banned for life, and huh. I can never get back on. No, you re you reposted your own show's video one time, the oh, first yeah. time, yeah. and they banned you. The only post, <laughs> the only <laughs> post I ever you. did. <laughs> wow. That's an amazing, that's just another, just another Rosillo <laughs> stat in there. You're like, what happened? <laughs> I forgot. About that. I was copyright infringement, lifetime ban on yourself, hosting on my own. <laughs> Literally, you are in the video. It's you in the video, and they banned you. Oh man, thanks. Wow. If that were the rule, God, if that were, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the fact he was making a few. Here's what I would say. The reason I said, uh oh, if you're just trashing WNBA stuff, there's a ceiling probably on where you can go with this. Yep. Yeah, you know, eighty sounds okay, about cool. right. <laughs> uh, and you know, maybe you got a a Daryl Armstrong turnover in there. Cool, but like, what what are we talking here? Like, how how even is it? And uh, I don't yeah, know. It's just like a if it's just, just a, a loop of Angel Reese missing layups, and like you're not gonna like we getting offensive rebounds through. Yeah, that's true. You're right. You're right. <laughs> You're right. I love that was some of my all. I'm telling you right now, all Angel Reese content is mostly terrible. When Wemby missed a couple shots and then that was actually picking up traction, it'd be like, oh, but you guys crash or crush Angel Reese for doing this. You know, like, okay, that's the same. Good argument. I'm mad I even brought it up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's just every time I see, like, and it's not anything, it has like nothing to do with her. It's just the arguments for her where I'll go, oh, yeah, okay. Got me. Uh, anyway, did we answer that without Kyle? Uh, help us out. Here. You're in management. Well, <laughs> I, I I refused TikTok. I outright refused it. I was really kind of salivating at the idea of like Twitter now X burning down and be like, all right, that's one less. I'm off Facebook. It's basically Instagram and Twitter. I was really hoping that they would the world would take it out of my hands and I'd be down to one, and then maybe I could flush that one day and just go get a flip phone or something. But like. Uh, I, I really don't know how how TikTok is different than Instagram or anything like that. So uh, all I know is Instagram, I guess you can like partner with people like maybe that like our guy cartoon radio. Um, mm-hmm. He like they like our guys, people. I don't know. I didn't want to 
do that wrong, but like they, they sort of like, you can, you know, collaborate with people. Maybe TikTok's the same way. I mean, that's, that's how podcasts work, right? You get a guest and now those people know your stuff and, and vice versa. So other, yeah, other than that, I don't really have any advice. I'm trying to stay out of the new social media game. I kind of feel like and I'm, I'm with you, Kyle, like I'm not a TikTok guy. We do have a show, Priscilla show, uh, TikTok that, uh, I think it's done well. It's good content on there. Go and follow it. You just can't. It's not Ryan because he's banned. Ironic it's the show account. And that's real. Um, and we, and I, and I, the guy Alex, who is our social guy, who puts a lot of these videos together. We've had these conversations, and it's just like it kind of blows our mind what works and what doesn't. Because I think there's like this awesome video, and it's just like five thousand views, and there's like one stupid one that I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of a throwaway, and it gets like you know half a million views, and it's so. I, there's not really any rhyme or reason. I feel like to these, it just kind of is at the whim of. You know, you just put it into the ether and whoever likes it, likes it. I will say it does feel like on TikTok, I could be wrong on this, but I think it's hard to become Instagram, Instagram, I'm sorry, TikTok famous if you're not like front facing, if you are not like part of the content, you know, who's no one's going to know kind of who you are. It's always going to be like a ceiling to what you're doing. So I don't know that you could really become TikTok famous unless like you are also kind of in the videos and maybe you're doing like the comedy thing and like you, you don't have to see your face. So that's fine. People just know your voice. But. I do kind of feel like the, that's why the selfie style videos things always work so well because that's just that's what people like. That's what resonates. So I don't know. That's a tip from a guy who kind of knows TikTok, but not really. That was actually a good answer. I, I might have just made all that sticks? up. I don't even know. Yeah. Sounded good. Did you review sticks? <laughs> yeah. Have sticks broken into the, the TikTok space yet? Or I mean, that that's awesome. I mean, Saruti, if you're not on the stick account, uh, that's good. You, you I'm should, not on the you should definitely account. get on it. You should get on it. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Have, everyone's. It's like a. It's like movie previews. Like when it's over, everyone will have an opinion on whether or not that looks good or not. And it's the same with sticks. Okay, good work, guys. We're fresh today. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Thank you to Wargon. Thank you to Saruti. Thanks to Kyle Ryan Rosilla podcast. Check out our YouTube page and subscribe as well. Happy birthday to Rosilla, too, by the way. What's up? Oh, that's right. Oh, HBD. shit. Really? Yeah. God damn it. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Happy birthday. In classic that's Ryan right, fashion, Kyle. we moved the date because we're recording this obviously on a Monday, not a Tuesday, our usual Tuesday. And I was like, hey, if you could do Tuesday or Monday, do you want? Is that cool? I know it's your birthday. You're like, yeah, I don't care. I'm not doing anything. Rather, I, you, you, I think your thing was actually, I prefer that. <laughs> so <laughs> a little, little insight into Rosilla there. Big I actually guy. forgot which day it was again. But the other times I could, but it's not like I forgot my birthday. I just kept thinking it was the, a different day. I don't, I, I know what date I was born. Um, but that's yeah, good. when you don't have kids, you know, yeah, no, that's good. It's, it's, <laughs> so you start forgetting that one. They do. Yeah. I forget how uh, old 11, I am all the time. 11, 27. Yeah. Like, yeah. no, so you weren't born in November. What's wrong with you? No. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it guys. You give me anything. Yeah, it's the exactly. It's New balance. Get hard. Yeah, get you nothing. Uh, I don't want anything except your support and continued hard work. All right. Uh, I already said all the stuff, so goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>